I first encountered John when I was an actor at the Guthrie Theater in the 70s, that long ago. He was, uh, he came in to design Rosencrantz and Guildenstern Are Dead, and I was playing Guildenstern. And I, that was the first time I met him, and it was a wonderful period there where there were some fantastic designers, great directors. But in the fitting room, getting into this costume as it evolved, it just was very special. You know, I thought, this, this man is, is really amazing. And the way he thought about the costume, it was, it was a little Renaissance, you know, pumpkin pants costume. But the way he thought about the costume and the way the costume felt and how it informed my performance was really unique. And then I thought that the whole production just looked so visually splendid. It was a really distinct vision. And so that's where I first worked with him as an actor. He um, was involved with a, a Shakespeare festival in California that was just starting up. And Michael Langham was supposed to be the artistic director. And Michael couldn't do it. And so uh, they asked me to. I had really mostly just acted at that point. And I think John had something to do with that. I'm not quite sure if that's true or not, because he had so much to do with so many aspects of my career later. But that was where then we really began to work together in, in a really serious way. And we did um, Romeo and Juliet and Taming of the Shrew in repertory. And then the next season we did Hamlet and Midsummer Night's Dream together. And that's when we really began to be collaborators. You know, uh, he just he just opened my mind to so many possibilities. We, we seem to have a really great um, feel for each other's heads. We weren't, we're not at all alike, but uh, there was something that, there was a hunger that both of us satisfied, I think, in the other, in some funny way, in the work we did together. And it was just always terrifically inspiring to think about these plays with John, you know. Um, I would have a big idea or he would have a big idea and then we would just run with it. And then, and then more often than not, you know, as we were about to show it to the tech staff, one of us would change our minds <laughs> and we'd try a whole other idea. So it was very um, fecund, you know, uh, this period where it was sort of just uh, it, everything be damned, we were going to find the vision for the, the piece no matter what. And it was tremendously fulfilling. <laughs> John challenges and contributes in, in, in many different ways. I mean, he, 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 can be, um, he can be very quiet about it. He can be, you know, throwing a coffee cup across the room. Um, uh, he could be uh, mind-blowingly thoughtful, you know, you would be working on something very carefully and John would sort of tiptoe up to you and say, I think this is all wrong, we need to start this process again. You're, you know, you, you need to rethink how, how this is going, how, how, how you're going about this. And he was always right. Or if he wasn't exactly right, it was something that, you know, pushed me then towards finding a solution. And I always felt we were doing it together, often with uh, Pat Collins, the lighting designer, the three of us were just holy terrors uh, <laughs> as a unit. And, um, and we would work at things together. So it was, it was uh, but John, you know, then, then John would like pretend to go to sleep. <laughs> and then I think sometimes he actually did go to sleep, <laughs> just like fine. But um, uh, because then when he'd wake up, he'd have five notes for you that, you know, you thought, oh, you weren't really sleeping. <laughs> He had many, many ways of, 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 of getting his points across. But he also was, and I don't think, you know, he hasn't done this for a long time, but he, he was a beautiful, uh, he, he drew so beautifully. And his renderings of costumes were simply stunning. I mean, you saw the character, you saw the feel of the, the scenes that that character was in, in his drawing. And often the drawing was very uh, sort of free and brusque and passionate, you know. But um, then he stopped designing costumes for the most part or stopped being interested in doing clothes because he didn't really, he wasn't, he, he didn't want to put up with, with the, the, I think the actors just 
needing as much as actors need from a costume designer. So he concentrated more just on scenery, but uh, which he also drew brilliantly before he began working more right in a model. You know, you, there used to be some drawings. And I missed his drawings just because they were just so beautiful. I have a few of them that he gave me or that I stole when we were working together. You know, I'd say, can I have this? <laughs> the Rat King from some, some Nutcracker, which I love. Um, but he, he had a wide range of ways of working at a production, a play, or a problem. And, um, and, and they were all useful, sometimes kind of mysterious, but always surprising. A lot of his work would be very surprising. It, the longer we worked together, um, though a shorthand developed, as I think it does with really fruitful collaborations, Always I would be surprised at what his ideas were. You know, we would talk about something and then he'd say, well, I'll have a model, a rough model to show you in a week or something. And I would go into the studio and see the rough model and sometimes it wouldn't be anything like what we talked about. Uh, and yet it, 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 it worked, or at least part of it worked, or there was something in it that drove us to the next step, which was really unique and what I really loved about working with him. One of the surprising ones was um, we worked together on Turn of the Screw, Benjamin Britten's opera for Glimmerglass. And um, what I saw in the model was, was so surprising. It was, a, it was a ramp that was in forced perspective, that was a kind of sickly, uh, very yellowy green. And then there were various objects just strewn around. The rest of the stage was black. And I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know, it, 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 it made no sense, which was exactly what I loved about it, you know. And it became, sometimes his work became an obstacle to, uh, to, to, to have an experience overcoming or working with, you know, I think John, when he was doing some of his most exciting work, there, there was an, it was an obstacle in the work for the performers and the director to have to deal with, but it was a sort of divine obstacle uh, that caused things to happen. And I learned so much about just stage space from him, just that you didn't have to have uh, the sofa here and the door back there and everybody, you know, that, Sometimes plunking something impossible in the middle of the space caused all sorts of beautiful things to, to, to happen around it and on it and you know, because of it. But the turn of the screw one was truly a surprise because I just thought, I don't, I don't understand this at all and that is not a problem for me, you know? <laughs> um, well, we haven't worked together for a, a while, but I feel like he has... When we were working together, I would say that we both went from what maybe would be called a more traditionalist approach to the work to, to far more abstracted ways of thinking about theater, making theater. And that, I think, was just a natural evolution for all of us uh, uh, from the 80s on. You know, there were so many exciting influences in the world in, in the theater in the, in the 80s, I mean, you had Mabu Mines doing its extraordinary work. You had Robert Wilson doing his earliest work. That started to happen. Andre Serban was doing amazing things at ART. And all of this was just galvanizing everybody in the theater, everybody who had a chance to look at it and think about it. Um, there were just, it was, a, it was a really great time in American theater, in American avant-garde. And you couldn't help but be affected by that, you know. And, it was also an era where um, exploration was encouraged. As somebody who was running a theater, the Hartford Stage, we were encouraged by the National Endowment for the Arts with, with huge grants. We were encouraged by the Mellon Foundation, by the Ford Foundation. The whole idea of making theater in this country was about making something new, making something challenging. In, in our case, because of my, my uh, my, my, my work in the classics of, of doing big 
statements, bold statements. That's just so different than what's going on now in nonprofit arts of all, you know, of a any kind. But John and I definitely benefited from that. I mean, all directors and designers did, but we really did because we were thinking on such a big scale a lot of the time. Um, we, you know, we did Shakespeare after Shakespeare, opera after opera. And he was also so encouraging to my career. I mean, he, you know, he, he I, I think the Hartford stage job really was very much a part of, uh, it was due to his influence. Uh, he, he grew up in that, in that um, uh, neighborhood. He, he was a part of that theater for a long time. I think he had a lot to do with the building of it. And also my work in opera was very much encouraged by him, I think. Opera Theater of St. Louis wouldn't ever have hired me without him saying, you should look at this guy. Santa Fe as well. So uh, at the Met, I'm sure, you know. And then I was able to reciprocate slightly by getting him involved in Glimmerglass, which was sort of, a, a, I thought it would be a huge favor to Glimmerglass, but I think it turned out to be a terrific um, partnership for, for both the opera company and John. Oh my gosh. Uh, because it makes you think, you know. It excites you visually. And you have to think about why you're excited about it. And it's existing in the space with the action, with the words. Um, it may not be immediately uh, coherent to you, uh, but something is vibrating in the space that's caused by that design and interaction with the music, interaction with the way the bodies are moving on the stage that the director has done. Um, and there's always, I think in John's best work, always something uh, rightly mysterious, you know. Um, many people have tried to copy him, you know, many famous designers. I've seen a lot of work where, you know, you think, oh my gosh, he's just ripped off a John Conklin set. Um, and it happens to all of us, but uh, he's, he's more influential than I think he even realizes himself. And nobody, but nobody has that touch. You know, you, that you can try to do that look, but nobody can do it the way he's, he's always done it. When we did Il Re Pastore, um, I remember that he showed me a model. We didn't really talk about it much because this was kind of late in our collaboration, our careers together, uh, by which point I would just say, if you have an idea, why don't you do it? Because I'm a, I'm a good responder. I'm better at responding than saying, I want a tree center stage, you know. So he, as I remember, had designed this very simple sort of childlike thing and very flat pieces. But there was a, there were words on a scroll in the middle of the set model by La Rochefoucauld, this sort of uh, French, I think 18th century, maybe earlier, uh, deliverer of maxims. And I fell madly in love with these words. And John said, oh, well, that's the rough code, you know. It was always like that with John. It was like this mind-blowing thing that he was obviously very familiar with. It was completely new to me. <laughs> so um, I, I, um, I immediately got a hold of a book of these, of these sayings by La Rochefoucauld, and that informed the whole production because we filled the production with these sayings. I think it was my idea to use a lot of children, and I think it was his idea to try to use these, these sort of very arch truths. And um, some of them were written on the blackboard by the children, some of them were brought on and you know, revealed by the children. Um, it was a very, very happy, uh, discovery to find our way into that production. And then it was just absolute hell to rehearse because we had all these little children from Cooperstown, <laughs> New York, who, who didn't know a stage from a, you know, <laughs> I don't know what. And the, I thought the stage managers would just lose their minds and be, be committed to an asylum by the end of the experience. And John would come up periodically to watch the rehearsals and he'd be sitting there looking at this madness that I'd be going through, tearing my hair out, with having all of these children in this opera with all of these adults, doing nothing but moving John Conklin's scenery all night long. It was a huge headache, but it was a great, 
it was a great success, and it just it, it lifted my heart. That production, I loved it. You know, sometimes you're not that crazy about the, the work that ends up on the stage, but I I was always happy with Il Re Pastore, and and it always I felt we 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 got to very central truths about the people in the opera. This very um, rather austere, uh, youthful work. Um, we somehow unlocked it with, between those children and those sayings, um, and then this extravagant 18th century costumes that he put in the middle of all that. It was a wonderful mixture. Oh. <laughs> I, there, there are, n nothing about John could fit into a nutshell. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs>